happy Friday. Happy Friday to all of us. All right. Um, as you saw, uh, speaking of yesterday, Secretary General last night uh, welcomed the ceasefire uh, that was, took place in uh, Gaza and Israel after 11 days of deadly hostilities. He extended his deepest condolences to the victims and for, um, excuse me, extended his deepest condolences to the victims of the violence and their loved ones. Mr. Guterres commended Egypt and Qatar for their efforts carried out in close coordination with the UN to help restore calm in Gaza and Israel. He called on all sides to observe the ceasefire. The Secretary General appealed to the international community to work with the United Nations on developing an integrated, robust packages of support for swift, sustainable reconstruction and recovery that supports the Palestinian people and strengthens their institutions. He also stressed that Israeli and Palestinian leaders have a responsibility beyond the restoration of calm to start a serious dialogue to address the root causes of the conflict. Gaza is an integral part of the future Palestinian state, and no effort should be spared to bring about a real national reconciliation that ends the division. Uh, and speaking of that, uh, humani those humanitarian needs, uh, our colleague Mark Lokok, the emergency relief coordinator, today allocated um, $4.5 million from the Central Emergency Response Fund uh, towards the rising humanitarian needs in Gaza. This is in addition uh, to the $14.1 million uh, which he announced earlier this week uh, for the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, which comes from the central uh, pooled funds for the OPT. So that total amount as of today of money we have dispersed is 18 million. $0.6 million. We also expect to have a three-month interagency flash appeal for the occupied Palestinian ter territory uh, issued next week. As soon as we have a firm date, we will let you know, but that'll probably be the middle of the week. Uh, strong financial support is, of course, crucial to meet the needs, especially in Gaza and also in the West Bank. It is also critical that the occupied Palestinian territory humanitarian fund is replenished. This is a flexible tool to quickly respond to urgent needs. Today, 13 humanitarian trucks with food, COVID-19 vaccines, medical disposables, and drugs, including emergency medicines, first aid kits for multiple UN agencies and NGO partners, crossed into Gaza following the partial reopening of the Karim Shalom uh, crossing. Um, the Erez uh, crossing was also opened temporarily for senior humanitarian officials. Uh, two of our senior most officials, Philip Lazzarini, the Commissioner General for UNRWA, and Lynn Hastings, uh, the head of the humanitarian operations for the uh, occupied Palestinian territory, um, both uh, traveled in uh, to Gaza this morning. Um, both uh, Mr. Lazzarini and Ms. Uh, Hastings have been spending some time not only visiting uh, uh, with uh, Gazans uh, and examining what uh, has happened, but they've also so, of course, thanked all the UN colleagues who have worked so hard to help the traumatized civilians under very, very difficult and dangerous circumstances. And following the ceasefire announcement, uh, the number of people seeking protection in UNRWA schools has now decreased to less than 1,000. As you may recall, the peak was about 66,000. Uh, just a senior personnel appointment to share with you today. Uh, Secretary General is appointing Martha Anna Akia Pobi of Ghana as Assistant Secretary General for Africa. And that is a post that is both uh, in the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs and Peace Operations. Uh, she succeeds, as you may recall, uh, Bentu Keita of Guinea, who took up a new role as head of the UN operations in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, Mr. Guterres is, of course, deeply grateful to Ms. Keita's service and contributions as the first Assistant Secretary General for Africa uh, for the peacebuilding and political, the peacekeeping and political departments. For her part, Ms. Pobi brings more than 30 years of experience in international affairs and diplomacy with the Guinean Foreign Ministry. Currently, she is the Chief Director of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. She was previously Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Ghana to the UN from 2015 to 2020. Much more on her career can be found in the email we sent out. 
This morning, the Secretary General spoke virtually at the Global Health Summit, which was co-hosted by the European Commission and Italy as chair of the G20. The Secretary General said from the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, he was deeply concerned about the possibility of what uh, he called a dangerous two-speed response. Sadly, he said that concern was justified with grossly unequal access to vaccines, tests, medicine, and supplies having left poorer countries at the mercy of the virus. Vaccinating quickly and thoroughly around the world together with continued public health measures are the only ways to end the pandemic and prevent more dangerous variants from gaining a foothold, the Secretary General said. He also repeated his call to the G20 to set up a task force that brings together all countries with vaccine production cap uh, capacities. The World Health Organization and the ACT Accelerated Partners and international financial institutions able to deal with the pharmaceutical companies and other key stakeholders. Let's be clear, he stressed, we are at war with the virus, and if you're at war with the virus, we need to deal with our weapons with rules of a war economy, and we are not there yet. This is true for vaccines, and it is true for other components in the fight against the virus. His remarks were shared with you, and a programming note that on Monday he will address uh, by pre-recorded video message the World Health Assembly. Uh, we will share both the video and the text under embargo Sunday morning with you. Uh, staying on COVID, a couple of updates from our country teams. Um, in South Sudan, the UN team is working closely with the authorities to accelerate vaccine efforts due to the low turnout for the campaign. More than 6,400 doses have been administered to date, with more than 12, well, excuse me, with more than 126,000 still pending. The UN team is helping to transport more than 62,000 doses of the vaccine to sites around uh, the country. The UN peacekeeping mission, the World Food Program are also helping to airlift uh, these shots. And from, from um, Namibia further south uh, today, uh, they received their second shipment of vaccines from COVAX. Our folks in Namibia are continuing to help the country with its vaccination campaign to ensure that all Namibians are vaccinated as a crucial step uh, for a better recovery. And from South Asia, UNICEF says it is urgently in need of $164 million to help save lives as a deadly wave of COVID-19 sweeps across the region. The funds will be used to procure oxygen and testing supplies, medical equipment and personal protective equipment. Among other supplies, South Asia, which is home to nearly 2 billion people, accounts for half of the known new infections globally. More than three new COVID-19 infections are being recorded every second, and more than three people are dying of COVID-19 every minute. And in Nepal, we, along with our partners, have launched a COVID-19 response plan seeking nearly $84 million to help 750,000 of the most vulnerable people impacted by the pandemic over the next three months. Millions of people in Nepal are struggling with direct health impacts of the pandemic. In addition, hunger, malnutrition, devastating economic losses, and other health needs are being overlooked. The poorest and most marginalized people are the hardest hit. Nepal is in the middle of its worst COVID-19 outbreak and is experiencing roughly the same number of daily cases per capita as neighboring India. However, the country's health system has much less capacity to treat COVID patients. After several months of relatively low cases, the numbers began increasing rapidly mid-April. Since May 5th, there have been over 8,000 cases registered every day. Over 44% of the COVID-19 tests in Nepal are coming back positive, suggesting the case numbers are in fact much higher than reported. And we are, our response plan calls for swift and, uh, action and international solidarity to save lives and prevent unnecessary suffering today and in difficult weeks to come. From Myanmar, the UN team there um, said today it is alarmed by the humanitarian impact of the violence in the town of Mindat in Chin State, and there have been reports of indiscriminate attacks by the security forces against civilians, resulting in civilian casualties and in people being displaced from their homes. Nearly 4,000 people have reportedly forced to flee since fighting escalated in Mindat since on May 12th, with thousands of people believed to be hiding in nearby forests and mountains. Sorry. Uh, Many civilians have reportedly not allowed to leave the town during the height of the hostilities. Our uh, team on the ground in uh, Myanmar is also concerned by reports that security forces use civilians as human shields and incidents of sexual assault perpetrated against women and girls. Many people urgently need 
of food, water, shelter, and access to health care, among other needs. While the UN and our partners are trying to assess and address the needs, their efforts are complicated by the continued fighting and road blockages. The UN country team calls on security forces to urgently take all necessary measures and precautions to spare civilians and civilian infrastructure and asks that all involved ensure safe and unhindered humanitarian access so we can all help people in need. And uh, I may have slightly buried the lead. Our colleague Christine Schragner Bergener will be briefing you here at 11 o'clock on Monday via video link from Bangkok, 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll send out the, the links. <clears throat> Um, moving on to Africa and Mozambique, where the World Health Organization today said that more than 1.2 million people urgently need health assistance in Cabo Delgado province, where recent armed attacks sparked further population displacement and deepened a protracted humanitarian crisis. According to WHO, violence and insecurity have damaged or forced nearly a third of the province's 130 health facilities. Uh, this has deprived communities of basic health services and sparked emergency needs for HIV, malaria, and TB treatment, as well as vaccination and safe delivery among internally displaced persons and host communities. Cholera prevention, COVID-19 response, and provisions of mental and psychosocial health services are also critically needed. WHO is revising its response plan and will deploy additional human material, excuse me, will deploy additional human and material resources to Cabo Delgado and other health emergency hotspots in the country as soon as they get additional uh, resources. WHO has mobilized $1.77 million to support the government and its partner organizations. And Jan Kubisch, our envoy for Libya, spoke at the Security Council this morning and discussed uh, preparations to hold presidential and parliamentary elections on December 24th. He said that in recent months, a state of political paralysis has been replaced by development that have been created, renew, have created renewed hope for Libya's reunification and its stability. The ceasefire continues to hold, Mr. Kubish said, adding that the security situation has significantly improved, although clashes between armed militia groups competing for influence, access to and uh, to and control of territory resources still occur from time to time. Mr. Kubish warned that the continued use and presence of uh, the continued use, presence, and activities of thousands of mercenaries, foreign fighters, and armed groups is in a significant threat not only to Libya's security, but to the region as a whole. The recent disturbing events in Chad remind us of the interrelated nature and links between the security situation in, Li in Libya and the security and stability of the region as a whole. His text was shared with you. And a couple of climate biodiversity notes. Uh, this morning, the Deputy Secretary General Mina Mohammed spoke at the G7 Climate and Environmental Ministers meeting. She said that this year is a make or break year in the global effort to restore our relationship with the planet, tackle the climate emergency, and get ahead of the pollution crisis. Despite positive signs on reducing emissions, she said that our main concern is the public finance gap and the lack of concrete support for adaptation. The G7 summit coming up in June will be a key moment for progress on finance, she said. She added that we need G7 leaders and other developed countries following suit to announce enhanced climate finance commitments for the period of 2021-2025, explicitly indicating the share of public climate finance as they pledge. When it comes to adaptation, Ms. Mohammed said we need to see an increase of climate finance to get to at least 50 percent allocated adaptation and that this should be easily accessible for small island developing countries and least developing countries. Those remarks were shared with you. And <clears throat> tomorrow is the International Day of Bio Biological Diversity. The theme this year is we're part of the solution. In his message, uh, the Secretary General said we need to protect nature, restore ecosystems, and establish a balance in our relationship with the planet. Uh, this morning, he spoke at a webinar on the road to the Biodiversity COP, which is coming up uh, in Kunming in China in October. He said the pandemic has reminded us of the intimate relationship between people and nature, and it provides an opportunity to recover better, adding that the solutions to the current crisis must expand opportunities, reduce stark inequalities, and respect planetary boundaries. Nature positive investments and actions can ensure that we all benefit from the dividends of biological diversity. A couple of other days to flag. Uh, today is also International Tea 
Day. T, T Day. T Day, T E A. Yes, T E A, yes. Uh, tea production and processing are a main source of livelihoods for millions of families, particularly in developing countries. The day celebration promotes and fosters collective action to implement uh, activities in favor of the sustainable production and consumption of tea. Also raises awareness uh, for its importance in fighting hunger and poverty. Um, and today is also World Day for Cultural Diversity and Dialogue Development. There's a nice message from the Secretary General on that. And Sunday is the International Day to End Obstetric Fistula. The theme this year is Women's Rights or Human Rights and Fistula Now. Celia. Uh, Stéphane, it's about uh, Mali. Uh, the French journalist Olivier Dubois was kidnapped. Uh, do we have an update on him? And is the UN mission helping in any way? Um, we very much hope that he will be released uh, unharmed uh, and uh, safe and sound. I mean, as we've always said, our journalists need to be able to do their work freely, free of any threat, uh, especially in these very difficult in these situations. Um, the UN mission, I'm not going to go into any details, obviously, uh, given his uh, status, but we, we are, of course, ready to help in any way we can. Ms. Salome and then Edie. Steph, I, I noticed that the Secretary General was one of many speakers to call for reviving negotiations through the Middle East Quartet uh, for a two-state solution in the Middle East. And I also noticed that the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. said that the U.S. would work with the international community for a lasting peace, but she didn't mention the Quartet. So I'm wondering if you've had any indication from the United States if they're uh, willing to engage in that forum. Uh, we continue to push to engage in that forum. Um, obviously, there are four parts to a quartet. Uh, we represent one leg of that quartet. Others have expressed uh, support. Uh, we continue to be in touch with the quartet envoys, and we do hope to be able to engage in that framework. So nothing, nothing, nothing yet from the... No. Can I just follow up yeah. also? We saw so much diplomacy happening here in the last week, yeah. and yesterday you mentioned it when you yeah. came in, um, uh, culminating with the ceasefire agreement in the middle of this in-person General Assembly meeting. Can you just give us some color, maybe, in terms of um, the mood in the past week and the level of engagement and, and <clears throat> how, I don't, uh, just what it felt like being behind the scenes here? Look, I, you know, I, I think... You were all as behind the scenes as I was, in, in a sense. I think there was a there was a there was certainly a buzz uh, in the building uh, yesterday, and I think the um, the fact that we had both a uh, general assembly meeting on uh, on the Middle East, we had a large number of foreign ministers who came, uh, held bilaterals with the secretary general. In parallel, we had these discussions going on in Doha. We had phone calls going on all over the world. Um, everything seemed to come together in a positive, uh, in a positive way. It also, I think, uh, reinforces uh, the the UN in New York as a as a meeting platform, right, where uh, these conversations that are both public and private can take place. Edie, uh, thank you, Steph. Um, today, um, there were clashes in Jerusalem between. Israel, Israeli police and uh, Palestinians celebrating the ceasefire and worshipers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, mm -hmm. uh, the largest uh, Islamic Muslim organization in the United States has called for condemnation. Um, what is the Secretary General's reaction to these clashes less than 24 hours after a ceasefire? I mean, we're, we're obviously very concerned uh, about the continuing tensions that we've seen uh, today in uh, occupied East Jerusalem, particularly in and around the Old City. It's very important that I think everyone uh, honor the sanctity of the holy sites uh, in the Old City. 
refrain from any provocation that could escalate uh, tensions. As, as you, you mentioned, this comes just a few hours uh, after the, the ceasefire. It's, it's, so it's important for everyone to show restraint and that the status quo at the holy sites uh, must be respected. And I think, it, you know, in these situations, I think both political leaders, religious leaders have a responsibility to speak out against uh, anyone who disrupts uh, peace and we should all stand firmly against uh, incitement and violence, especially in such a tense environment. Can I ask on a completely different subject? Um, on Myanmar, the head of the military installed electoral commission uh, said that they are considering outlawing Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy party which ruled Myanmar before the coup. Uh, what is the Secretary General's reaction to that possibility? I mean, sh should that happen, I think that would be a clear step in the wrong direction. What we have all been working for, uh, what the Security Council, the international community has been working for, is a restoration of democracy and a restoration of the voice of the people of Myanmar. Seria uh, Espanol, and then we'll go to Beitul. Thank you, Stefan. Um, yesterday, the High Commissioner for um, Refugees sent a message to the United States appealing for the government of Joe Biden to remove the Title 42nd, which prevent uh, migrants coming into the United States at the border. Um, and he says that is. Um, preventing people with legitimate asylum claims to be able to enter and then is putting pressure in the towns in northern Mexico. Um, what's the position of the Secretary General, especially because it's over a year with the Title 42, um, thousands of people have been returned. A lot of them are in terrible conditions at the border. I mean, we, we, uh, we have nothing to add and, and support, obviously, uh, the voice of the High Commissioner for, for Refugees. That's, he speaks. Uh, to member states in that regard. It's his, and so we fully, we, we have no, there's no light in a sense, and that's his, his responsibility. Uh, <clears throat> for our part, as you know, the, the UN system has been present for some time in northern Mexico through various agencies in trying to support those people who are stuck on the Mexican side of the border. Beitul. Thank you, Steph. I would like to take you to the SG's report on children in armed conflict in Syria. Uh -huh. I did my work, read the report. Um, the UN signed an agreement with the SDF in Syria two years ago to make sure that they stop recruiting children as fighters. But despite that agreement, they kept recruiting. And according to the report, there are more than 400 children still being recruited mm -hmm. by SDF. Uh, what do you have to say on that? Well, I mean, the, the report is exactly for that. It is to uh, bring, bring light uh, to all the violations that we continue uh, to see. It is important that, you know, whether in Syria or any other places, governments, armed groups, or any other entities uh, work to stop recruiting children, uh, to stop putting children in harm's way. Uh, the, the mechanism of children in armed conflict is, is one to obviously bring light to it, but is, we also, and the, and the office offers assistance to those groups and entities and governments on how to go about that. And we would want everyone to engage uh, with Ms. Gamba's office. All right, uh, we'll go to the screen. I think Michelle has a question. Let me see what the yeah, thanks, dance, dance card is. Yes, go ahead. Um, just a bit of a follow-up to Kristen's question about uh, the quartet. Does the Secretary General view the quartet as sort of the best avenue to try and revive peace talks? Look, I, you know, I think there are a lot of avenues. There are a lot of different tools. I don't want to, I'm, I'm not a ranking person. Uh, there, are, there, are the for, there are different formats. The quartet, I think, is a critical, uh, is a critical entity in that it brings, it, it brings together these four uh, important parties who have been involved in the process for a long time. It represents, in a sense, the, the, the large part of the international uh, community. It has served, uh, I think it has served a positive purpose uh, in the past, and it can continue to do that. And the Russian foreign minister was last week pushing for a ministerial meeting of the quartet. Are there any dates under discussion? Uh, not that, I mean, I'm not aware. I, I'm, 
I'm not a possibility. To, I'm not in a position to confirm uh, any uh, any dates. Um, Mr. Barada. And just one, one more, one Go, more quick one. Yeah. <laughs> it's Friday. Um, one more quick one. The U.S. ambassador yesterday in her statement made a point of saying that, you know, any aid that is given to help Gaza should go to the Palestinian people and not Hamas. Um, could you just, you know, sort of remind us of the UN's uh, involvement, I guess, with Hamas and how they ensure that aid finds the right people? Well, our aid is distributed uh, is distributed by uh, by the UN entities who are working directly uh, on on the ground. Our main uh, our interlocutor for anything official is obviously the uh, the Palestinian uh, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but we do the district we distribute aid for the most part uh, directly. And I think what's important to note is that all the aid uh, that goes out, uh, the monies and aid that goes out through the UN uh, is uh, clearly tracked uh, and audited throughout the process. Uh, Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. I have a couple of questions as well. And one of the questions, Eddie, took it from me as, as always. Okay, uh, in, in the uh, in the past, uh, Stefan, in the Israeli attack on Gaza in 2008, 2009, the U.S. did uh, the U.N. did an internal investigation of attacks on new UNRWA schools. Similar act happened in 2014 when the U.N. also conducted an internal investigation of the damage that endured by new UNRWA schools. Is the UN doing similar investigation of the damage that could be inflicted on new UN properties and UN schools this time? I mean, obviously, now that the dust has settled, uh, as I told our senior officials are on the ground. In... Sorry. It's OK. Uh, now that the dust is settled, as I mentioned, our two of our senior most officials in the region are on the ground. We're obviously looking at, at what has happened, what has been, uh, what has damaged, uh, when there is anything more official uh, to share. And if there is, I will uh, flag that to you. You had a second question? Yes, I do. During the uh, Israeli aggression on Gaza, which lasted for 11 days, 30 Palestinians, 30 Palestinian killed had not been mentioned in any statement, or there was no separate uh, focus on those uh, civilians killed in the West Bank, including a young woman in Hebron. Why is that? I think we did. Uh, first of all, I think we did refer to uh, events in the West Bank, and I think we were very clear on uh, on condemning the loss of life of all uh, civilians. Uh, Ms. And my last question, yes. uh, the Europeans now are talking about uh, maybe, that's what they say, dealing directly with Hamas uh, in order to achieve maybe some comprehensive peace. Uh, does the Secretary General share this view? Well, I mean, we, we were very clear, and we announced, I think, uh, yesterday, uh, I can't remember what day we are. I think yesterday morning I mentioned that uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Venisland uh, had been in Doha uh, and had been speaking to Hamas uh, Hamas representatives, and that's part of his uh, his job uh, in trying to being part of that group uh, that helped settle this um, the, the the cessation of hostilities, the ceasefire. You need to talk to the people who were involved in the firing if you're going to get a ceasefire. Thank you. Um, uh, Ali, I think I've passed you over, Mr. Barada. And then we'll go to Mr. Sato. Thank you, Stefan. Um, uh, so there are a lot of calls now uh, for uh, cooperation with the United Nations to provide aid to the Palestinians and to uh, provide the construction uh, uh, assistance. Uh, should that happen? As the uh, Secretary General believed uh, through the Security Council, is there a need for a product from the Security Council? And I have a question: If you have any 
<laughs> UN verified information about how many children were killed on both sides. Uh, for your last question, I think I would refer you to our human rights uh, colleagues who may have some updated uh, figures. I don't have, uh, so I don't have that uh, right in uh, in front of me. But I know our human rights colleagues have produced and uh, produced updates, as I think our humanitarian affairs colleagues have. Uh, uh, on your first question, I think I need to kind of separate the two. Uh, we would always welcome a, a, a strong voice from the Security Council to help cement uh, what has been achieved, which is the ceasefire, and, and lay a, a vision for the road ahead, for renewed political dialogue, uh, leading to a two-state uh, solution. On, on the humanitarian end, uh, the ball is, is moving. Uh, as you saw, we released today some more funds. We'll have a flash appeal in the middle of next week. Uh, obviously, our OCHA colleagues, UNRWA, and all the others uh, will be speaking to, to donors. Um, so, so that's part of our ongoing existing uh, mandate. Uh, just if you, uh, if I may follow up. So there are a lot of civilians who were killed in this uh, conflict. And I wonder whether the SG would call for um, any kind of accountability, uh, since he was always warning that there should be a respect, full respect for international humanitarian law. And I want to ask specifically about that building, uh, which was housing uh, our colleagues in AP and Al Jazeera and other uh, media outlets, it was targeted, and whether anything should be done regarding that building. You know, when I mean, on that building, I think the Secretary General expressed his opinion even uh, yesterday again in the General Assembly. Whenever civilians are killed, whenever civilian infrastructure is destroyed, there needs to be accountability. Uh, Mr. Sato. Uh, I, I, I may I, I may ask on on COVID, please. Yes, you may. Uh, so uh, we saw that relatively large meeting happening yesterday in the General Assembly, and I wonder whether you have any plans for the uh, high-level meetings to uh, in person uh, in September, and uh, also a question on whether I understand that you want to respect the freedom of every person to declare or not to declare whether they have the vaccines. But is it the Secretariat's right to tell people you're not allowed to go to the UN building if you're not vaccinated, even within the UN personnel? Look, uh, as you recall, uh, you may not recall, on Wednesday, uh, we presented a non-paper uh, to the President of General Assembly and member states outlining different scenarios on how we can increase uh, conference support uh, for the member states as of June 1st. Uh, we are standing by to implement whatever decision uh, member states uh, may wish to take on this matter. Our ultimate goal, and I think everyone's ultimate goal, is a return to normal as quickly and as safely as possible. As part of that, we will obviously look at uh, requirements uh, in terms of tests and, uh, and, and vaccines. All right. Do you have any numbers? Do you have any numbers? I know, I know, but you have to bear with me. This is a very critical issue. Do you have any numbers within the UN personnel? How many were vaccinated? Uh, UN personnel are encouraged to self-report uh, their vaccination status. As, as you, you know, we all have, uh, well, we all have rights in, in if you are in the U.S. Uh, through uh, HIPAA, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, nobody forcing you to share medical information. So we ask people to self-report. We are encouraging people to self-report. Um, given that we all live in either, you know, I assume uh, New York, uh, New Jersey, or Connecticut, uh, I think, and we're all, all people who come into this building and work here are over the age of 12. Uh, everyone should have been able, should they, should they physically be able to receive it, should have gotten the vaccine. So uh, we encourage people to be vaccinated, whether at the UN or around the world, um, but UN staff are self-reporting. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Sato, you've Thanks. been... No, uh, um, I'll come back to you a bit later, Ali. Let's go to Mr. Sato. He's been very patient today. I said, I said thank you. I am not... I give an opinion. This, I, don't, I have no opinion on that. I was almost a victim. No, uh, I, uh, Ali, they, Ali, 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 Ali. This is not the General no, Assembly. It's, it's not a place to opine. Uh, Mr. Sato. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Good to see you again. So my question about uh, uh, Palestinian and also Myanmar, a few you just mentioned. So uh, first of all, uh, the, as for the uh, ceasefire, uh, even though the ceasefire has uh, just announced, but uh, uh, even in New York, there are uh, uh, some conflict between the uh, Israel supporters and uh, Palestinian supporters last night, and uh, there was some conflict. And also, there are uh, supposed to be the some uh, protests and uh, uh, scheduled in, in the, this weekend. Uh, what can Secretary General say uh, about uh, this hostility still going on between the two parties? You know, we've seen some reports of demonstrations in York. I think, first of all, people have a right to express themselves freely, uh, but it is in very important that there be no violence and extremely important that there be no hate speech in any way, uh, shape, or form. Anything that would just make the situation, uh, the situation uh, worse. The second question is about Myanmar, just uh, you, uh, it, was, it is a good opportunity for media to hear from the, uh, the Berg, Ms. Uh, Ms. Bergner next Monday. Can you uh, share the, any uh, latest information about the situation in Myanmar? I mean, not, nothing more than what I shared earlier from the, the country team. Uh, but she will, um, and she will have the, the latest. And we'll see, so at 11 o'clock, it'll be before the briefing, uh, given that she's in Bangkok, so it'll be 11 a.m. here and she'll be piped in by video. Okay, uh, Celia, yes. Thanks, Mr. Stefan. Um, does the Secretary General or the United Nations are involved in the possibility of restarting talks between the Maduro government of Venezuela and the opposition? Um, last week, Guaido spoke about the possibility and the government of Maduro have said that they are open to that possibility. Is anything that they... You I mean, we, I, I've seen the press reports even this, this morning. We obviously, are, as always, are available to, to parties should they, should they need our assistance in any way, shape, or form. But I'm not aware that we've received any specific request in that format. Uh, Stefano, and then we'll go to, um, uh, to Brendan. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, yes, come back to the uh, Israel-Palestinian conflict. Um, well, we all know this is the oldest, actually, of the UN, you know, is uh, the partition resolutions, the oldest one. We, we, we are here looking at deja vu, deja vu, deja vu. So my question is, uh, after this, we all happy, a ceasefire, but what does the Secretary General that is looking for his uh, second mandate, does he, has, does he have a, a plan, something, to change the history of this conflict. And we have a <clears throat> every three, four, five years. You know, if he had a, ra a magical rabbit out of his hat, I don't think he would have waited for the second mandate to pull it out, uh, should he even get it, that I, I don't want to prejudge uh, anything. Um, but I, I think what's important, and it's what the Secretary General himself said yesterday, is that, you know, we use this opportunity yet again to actually address the fundamental uh, political uh, issues that need to be addressed. Um, you're right, we've been dealing with this, uh, this issue for quite, uh, for quite some time. Uh, the end goal is, um, is laid out in various Security Council resolutions, General Assembly uh, resolutions. Um, the international community needs to do whatever it can to support the parties in getting to that goal, to support the parties in getting in political uh, discussions. The international community should do that and, and avoid any uh, action or speech that would move uh, us away from that goal. Okay, Mr. Varma. Sorry, I'm sorry. Can I do just a quick, just a quick uh, follow-up? And just saying that 
What I was trying to say is, that isn't it time for bold, bold hatching by Secretary General of the United Nations? You know, at, at the end of the day, the, the bold action will have to come from the parties themselves. That's fine. That's fine. Have a great weekend. See you Friday. Oh, see you, yeah, see you Monday.